and welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. That's Bud Elliott. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you live at YouTube.com slash Cover 3 and everywhere you get your podcasts on demand. Thanks for hanging out. Smash that subscribe. Smash that like and come and join us in the chat, a.k.a. the Cover 3 tailgate. Lots to get to here. Wednesdays during the season. Big game breakdown. And we've got the biggest game coming up on Monday night, the college football playoff national championship between one seed undefeated Michigan and two seed undefeated Washington. So we are going to go inside that matchup with a big game breakdown title game edition coming up next. Also, when we were last with you on Monday night, recapping two epic semifinals, each decided on the final play of the game. We dedicated most of our time to that and also the the way too early preview. We did not get a chance to circle back with some of our takeaways. And and yeah, we've got some uh, from those games that were the New Year's Six games, uh, the beginning of the Nico era, and everything else that we have to take away from New Year's Day and more. So we'll get into a little bit of a New Year's Bowl wrap-up, just kind of buttoning up everything before we turn our attention on to the title game in full. But We begin with a little bit of portal buzz, and I'm glad that Bud Elliott is with us today because one of the headlines uh, from the recent days is that DJ Uyunglele, formerly a five-star prospect, formerly of Clemson, formerly of Oregon State, has committed to Florida State. Florida State uh, making the news official as well. We had DJU visiting a while ago. Um... We knew that Florida State was in the mix here. Before we get to the fit, can I just ask about the mechanics of this? Like, what's what led to sort of the timing of that announcement um, for DJU to go to Florida State? Because I mean, could could this have already been done a week ago? Maybe. I, I think it could have been done two weeks ago, right? right. So Cam Ward was FSU's one. DJ was there too. Oh. Cam Ward was, I think, everybody's number one. Yeah, I don't think Cam Ward wanted to play college football. Like the info that I was told, the vibe from people who talked to Cam Ward in his camp was that Cam Ward, the people around him, I think his parents wanted him to play college another year and get a big NIL check. And Cam Ward wanted to go pro. So FSU is like, we need to have a backup plan, right? In case we can't get Cam Ward. And if you're Florida State this year, it's a rebuilding year. It's going to be a very young football team. They like Brock Glenn a lot. They like Croman Hoke, the, the the high four star kid that they just signed in you know two weeks ago. But I think they have to have a steadying force so they don't like so you don't run the risk of going six and six or seven and five, right? Mm-hmm. If you go eight and four or nine and three, that doesn't kill you. But if you go six and six, it looks like a step back. So you have to get a quarterback who's a stabilizing force to come in there and battle Brock Glenn for the job. I don't think DJU is amazing. I mean. He's what, like 23 years old now? If he was amazing, he'd be going to the NFL. But mm-hmm. he's a decent college quarterback. All right, before we get, go on, you just said to come in and battle Brock Glenn for the job. Is there an outcome that you see where Brock Glenn beats out DJU for QB1 in 2024? Sure. I don't think DJU is special, right? I mean, I, I, I think Brock, they do think Brock Glenn is has some real juice to him. So I, I think they'll have it be a competition. Like at this point, I would expect DJU to win the job, but uh, I, I don't think he's anything special. So, uh, yeah, I, I can't rule out that possibility. Damn it, bud. I wanted you to come in here, fire it up, and hype it up DJU. No, come make- on. Have you watched him play? Like, he's a but, – But Danny's going to. And Danny spent the last two years talking about how Kate Klubnick needed to be starting over DJ. So I needed Danny to come in here and be like, DJU's great. He's going to win a bunch of games. Oh, my Damn God. It. You're, no. you're sticking to your opinion. <laughs> Look, if you're on a national show four or five times a week, you can't just say one thing on Monday and say something totally different on Tuesday. He's a pretty good get for this year's crop of portal quarterbacks. It's yeah. not a good year for to be a portal quarterback, especially without Kim Ward. Yeah, I mean he's he's a downgrade from Jordan Travis, but he is he is a high high flourish kind of option, like you were saying, to make sure the bottom doesn't fall out because it is going to be hard to replace Jordan Travis. But I think you know, in a sense, in a way. The fact that he's older kind of helps because we've seen that with Bo Nix and Michael Penix. Like these guys are all older, they're experienced, they have they're far more comfortable and understand what's going on. And I think that 
kind of plays out in the way that they play on the field and that there, there isn't anything at this point they haven't seen. And I think it's nice to have that. So I'm like, yeah, I don't think DJU is some kind of, oh, wow, Florida State's going to be a real threat next year with DJ back there. But he is somebody who it's like, all right, he's not going to cost us games. He could, He's not going to go out there and beat like a national title contender for you, but he's not going to cost you a game against Duke or Wake Forest or anything. And then what are the yeah, other title contenders? Yeah. Well, what are the other roster questions here? Like, is is the work done for Mike Norvell? Like, what is what is the what are those pieces going to look like? You've answered the quarterback position. You've created some competition for Brock Glenn. Um, you know, for example, Hakeem Williams. Like, you're going to be excited about that. Like, you do have, like you mentioned, some some young players who are probably going to have to take on a lot of work. Are is is the roster pretty much set here, or do you think that Norvell and his staff still have more work to do? I, I think they have more work to do, um, you know, because they I, I don't think they're a very good high school recruiting staff relative to what the expectations of the program are. So they missed on some important guys down the stretch in high school mm -hmm. and they decided not to take backup plans in high school. So they're going to portal, you know, probably a couple more spots. I, I think that they are uh, they're in on, on uh, scouting the kid from Purdue, who's like a really good pass rusher. I think they have a, a some shot at him. They really like Lance Hurd, the tackle who. That LSU. actually is is a, a kind of a rare thing. Hurd can really play. LSU has two guys who aren't old enough to go pro yet at tackle, so he wasn't going to be able to play tackle at LSU. That's a guy that'll be uh, very much in demand, so we'll see there. They would like to get a uh, a speed guy, for like a, a speed slot type dude in the portal. Um, probably a, like just some – some veteran help at linebacker, like maybe not even guys to come in and, and be guaranteed starters, but just some dudes to where you're not having to play just all true freshmen. If some guys get hurt, mm -hmm. um, those are, those are primarily the positions and maybe everybody's always looking for more O-line depth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Tom, what do you think? DJU is going to get to play Clemson next year. I mean, that's, that's about as good as it gets, right? It's going to be a crazy ACC championship. Cade versus DJ. One man, two man enters, one man leaves. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. I, I think you just said uh, Grayson McCall, right? Grayson McCall playing in Charlotte in the ACC championship game. That's that's what we're going to be looking for. That's right. He's at NC State. Yeah. yeah. We'll see. We'll see. I think, yeah. Help Miami, right? No. Wait, hey, well, yeah, hey, so while we're sitting it's here in year three Buzz, for Cristobal. All right. So we're They're sitting here in Portal Buzz because you time. mentioned Cam Ward. So the, it was a bing, bang, boom. Like, Cam Ward's going to be making his announcement. And then all of a sudden, it's like, hi, I'm Cam Ward, and I'm declaring for the NFL draft, which to hear they have mentioned, like, every time you see a report from Cam Ward, it's like he's expected to make a decision soon. The NFL draft is still an option. Like, it's becoming pretty clear he's waiting for a draft grade before he makes any decision. I, well, I don't think Cam play. Ward wanted to play any more college football. Yeah. Yeah. That was the vibe that people I know thought. It's like, mm -hmm. so if you're recruiting Cam Ward, you better have a backup plan. So, what's Miami's backup plan? You tell me because everybody That's thinks Will Howard's going right to Ohio there. State. That pause was incredible. <laughs> I mean, hey, dude, Jacurry Brown did put up 24 points against Rutgers. So I I think I'm I'm all aboard Team Jacurry Brown. <laughs> that, was a, that was a great football game played in the rain and the wind. He's ready for the Big Ten. Flashback. Yeah, take let's go, let's jump in a like a time traveling machine and let's go back to another time in college football and tell you that Rutgers just beat Miami in a bowl game. Hell yeah. Yeah, that's, that Big Ten money, baby. That's what that's what oh. Miami, Florida State, and Clemson are trying to get. That's why they need it so they can compete with Rutgers. So when it comes to the quarterback dominoes in the transfer portal, we do have another one with Liberty quarterback Caden Salter uh, entering after Liberty's loss to Oregon in the Fiesta Bowl. As we, uh, Will Howard is still out there as well. Um, what what are we looking at in terms of what are some of those best available quarterbacks that are uncommitted? If you are a Miami, you know, if you are one of these other schools that is still looking to uh, secure uh, secure a potential starter or bring in some depth. Well, but Bud just mentioned it. Will Howard, a lot of people seem to think, is going to end up at Ohio State. He's visiting there this weekend. And I will just say, you know, Florida State replaces Jordan Travis with DJ Ux. It has to replace Jordan Travis. USC is going to replace Caleb Williams with who it has to replace him with because they have to replace him with. If Ohio State kind of ran Kyle McCord out of town for Will Howard, I'd 
don't really know that I understand what they're doing there because you cannot convince me Will Howard is a better quarterback than Kyle McCord. Will Howard is a more mobile quarterback than Kyle McCord, but he has a lower completion rate. He has lower yards per attempt. He has a worse touchdown to interception ratio. I don't think that'll be an upgrade. I think that'll just be a change. I think based on who wanted Will Howard, like USC until Miller Moss balled out, Miami, Ohio State, versus who wanted Kyle McCord, Syracuse. I'm going to defer to the market of coaches. Mm-hmm. And I think Will Howard's a lot better than, than Kyle McCord. Like the guys who get paid millions to do this, none of them wanted Kyle McCord. Yeah, so like I, I don't what think did, Kyle what did, what did What did Will Howard's coach at Kansas State want? Avery Johnson. Well, yeah, like, but a lot of people wanted Avery Johnson. Like, I, I, Kansas State had to pay up a ton to keep him. Like, like a ton of big schools came at him down the stretch, and they, they, they rattled the couch cushions and, and were able to keep him. I'm, I'm just gonna plant my flag and say I think these coaches are wrong. And like I said, that's Lincoln I mean, Riley. Totally Lincoln be. Riley needed to find a replacement. Miami needs to find a replacement. Florida State needs to find a replacement. Ohio State was comparing Kyle McCord to C.J. Stroud and Justin Fields. Now they're comparing Will Howard to whoever the hell he was competing with at Kansas State, playing against the Big 12. I don't think he's a better quarterback than Kyle McCord. Maybe that's, I'll be 100% wrong, fair. but that's just how I feel. No, that's that's fair. I I don't think Kansas State was going to be able to keep both. Right. You know. What What about Salter? Where's he going to What's a, What's a good fit? Liberty. Alabama? <laughs> you really think Caden Salter is going to end up at Alabama? Well, I'd rather have him than Jalen Milrow, but I, I don't think he's going to go to Al- Alabama. But just, I mean, they they took Tyler Buckner post spring last year. They were p- clearly pretty concerned how, about quarterback. I, how big is Salter? Because I mean, he is not a large human being. He's skinnier, but he's not short. Yeah. Six two, six three. Yeah, is I, he six look, three? Uh, Auburn coached him, right? Or excuse me, Hugh Freeze coached him, and then so he might that might Auburn. be where he's headed. What What oh. is his relationship like with? Uh, yeah. yeah, six one. Now I, I I talked to Cam Coleman at Under Armour practice yesterday, and uh, and I was like, "What do you think you're doing the portal?" And he's like, "I, I think that we're going to stick with Peyton Thorne." And Co- Coleman is, for my money, like the second best receiver recruit in the country, and in most years would be the number one receiver in the country. Like, kid is a freak. He's killing all the other five star TBs out here on a routine basis. It, it is college football fans will know that name pretty soon. Cam Coleman, his, his ball tracking and going down the field. But he thinks Auburn's sticking with Peyton Thorne, so we'll see what wow. happens. Okay, that's th- that's intel from a five-star uh, Auburn receiver signee. Would they tell him that, or would they just are they just hyping up their QB while selling him on the program? That's look, that's totally fair. Yeah. But One I, question back to Ohio. I, oh, go ahead, Tom. I will say I would rather have Caden Salter than Peyton Thorne. Easily. Too. Yeah. Okay. Yes. We are total <laughs> agreement on that. Bing, bang, boom. U N I T Y. Um, would you rather the- have Jaden Maeva than Peyton Thorne? Because I think I would. The UNLV kid? Yeah. Oh, no. yeah, yeah. Probably. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I just. <laughs> would you rather have like Malachi Nelson pretty- than Peyton Thorne? Yeah. I feel like I've been pretty clear about Peyton Thorne since the moment he ended up going to Auburn after he left Michigan State. There's a lot of guys I think I'd rather have than Peyton Thorne. Um, Cover three tailgates rocking and rolling. Everybody who's hanging out, please uh, smash that like. And if and if you're in the cover three tailgate, you're clearly already a subscriber. Uh, so I do want to bring this question from there. So um, Aaron Nolan is an early enrollee. Mm-hmm. And you still have Devin Brown. You still have Kine Holtz for now, right? Is there any chance that Aaron Nolan ends up being Ohio State's answer? If he's competing against Will Howard, yes. I'd be surprised. Okay. I think Aaron Nolan's a good quarterback. I don't know if he's going to be. Uh, that would surprise me, I guess. But it is college football. Things happen. Sure. <laughs> but it would surprise me. You sound like. Oh, by the way, th- there are like Miami Malachi Nelson rumors. Oh, that would be nice for them. That would that would be a great. Considering the way that things have broken, that would be a, a solid spot for Miami to land uh, along the way. Uh, one other headline, this one actually breaking just before we got going live at youtube.com slash cover three. Uh, University of North Carolina head coach Mac Brown announcing that he and defensive coordinator Gene Chizik are parting ways. Uh, there's a little bit of a staff shakeup right now that also includes the defensive line coach being out. They're going to move some titles around, but 
They will also begin a national search for a new defensive coordinator immediately. This is something that you see when coaches are not quite on a hot seat, you know, like the, the sacrifice of your coordinator to answer the thing that didn't go well. We don't often see it with uh, coaches who are in the Hall of Fame already who have you know national championship rings, but when you have back-to-back late-season collapses that happen in part because of your shortcomings on the defensive side of the football, when your record in November and December is poor and you have all these seasons that, get off, that start with off-season hype, strong start, poor finish, the inability to get stops, Gene Chesick now pays the price for that. So, either immediately, do you think that, like, Tom, do you think being defensive coordinator for Matt Brown at North Carolina is going to be a good job? Like, do you think they're going to be able to throw that out in the market and be able to attract someone who's going to change, you know, your opinion of what North Carolina is going to be next year? No. I mean, it's, I thought Bateman was a good DC. I thought he was, re- what he did, was able to do at Army. And I, again, it's, the personnel he had is why I thought he was good because I felt like the schemes he was able to come up with to help counteract the talent level of player he had were very interesting and very good. And clearly it didn't work for him at North Carolina, <clears throat> but like the fact that you had to go to Gene Chizik out of the SEC studios in Charlotte, mm-hmm. like to be your defensive coordinator the last time and situation hasn't gotten better. Like I, I think there's talent on that defense. And I think that they Chizik, during that the last couple of years has really failed to take advantage of some of that talent. I just don't know if it's like a super attractive job, but it's also a, you know, it's an ACC defensive coordinator job. I was going to call it power five, but I feel like there's no more such thing as a power five. It's the power. Team. No, but listen, it's, right. it's a power conference job in the market where you're going to be able to put a price tag and a salary and live in Chapel Hill. Like you could, I, I think that there's at least a, a good job. Aspect yeah. It's a good job, but yeah. it's just, I don't know if you're going to get like the hot, young up and comer although like you know maybe jim leonard like i i think that that is somebody that is it is interesting to me that jim leonard does not have a dc job yet and it's like i don't know what he's waiting for because i know there have been offers it is it a good job because of the money more so than the situation i think yeah like we we just did this mac brown fired a damn good d coordinator and jay bateman and the narrative they put out was it was Jay Bateman's fault, right? Well, Jay Bateman went to went to Florida, and their linebackers played okay. And now Jay Bateman's going to be the Texas coordinator A&M. at Texas A&M mm-hmm. for a guy who knows defense in Mike Elko. Like I, I can't believe North Carolina is letting Mac Brown do this. But on the other hand, I can because I think they're an unserious football program, right? They're soft. It seems like the boosters like Mac Brown, so they're just going to let him coach forever. It, they they underachieve like crazy relative to their talent level every year. They get pushed around by mediocre ACC teams. I just, cool. Maybe this next D coordinator will. I, I feel bad for the players, except I don't because they could just transfer if they, if they, you know, wanted something different. So like now that you have player empowerment, if you don't like the situation, get out. I just North Carolina to me is an unserious program under Mac Brown. I thought Mac Brown was an unserious hire actually, but like wow. the fact they've kept this thing going this long, his teams are so soft, man. Well, all right, you just so- wasted, you just wasted two first round picks at quarterback. Well, right? Chip, Chip knows why North Carolina is soft. It's the Carolina you know. blue. Yeah, it can. You yeah. just like that's the least intimidating yeah, it's, color. It's in the, the least intimidating color possible. No, the to me, the way that I have diagnosed this is that you are right. In all of these like signing days that Mac Brown has come out, he's been able to show you a four star defensive end. He's been able to show you, you know, a four star in state defensive player that they won a battle for. And you're like, wow, you know, he's throwing out these top 30 class after top 30 class. But I think the reason why we have these late season collapses is there is not true depth. And I just think that they lean on those first stringers so hard early in the season that a couple of injuries or even just running out of gas late in the year, they just, they're just like, they're running in quicksand. I mean, you saw the way that North Carolina looked against NC State. They were looking like someone had just downgraded all of their sliders on the video game to where they could not move as quickly. And I, I think that um, there's a mentality aspect to this, and whether it's from the coaching or the strength and conditioning standpoint, maybe it's you know the way that you are preparing your players. I I just think that 
that has to be addressed as a, from a philosophical standpoint. And maybe that's going into the portal. And maybe that can't be fixed with a new defensive coordinator. But the lack of like really true depth and the fascination and the overemphasis on some of these, you know, high end guys, it's just it's just leaving them moving slow at the end of the year. So ha- what's going to change, right? Because you, you've got an offenses Nothing. that have been able to go out there and you know put that up could change. Yards. The, the the offense could take a major step back because you're losing and, Drake. May. And maybe that means less snaps. Maybe that means they don't play as many snaps early in the year. Who knows? But what was the kid's name who started the game? How long do they let Mac do this? I so that's the other thing that I would be concerned about in turn. If I was a defensive coordinator, are you just going to go when it's just one or two more years? Well, I'm going to need a guaranteed two year deal, and right. and my agent's going to try to get me a guaranteed three year deal because of the fear that Mac Brown, they'll never fire him, right? They would just tell him like, hey, like retire to save face. I would assume, right? It's kind of the same thing with Florida. Like, who's going to come coach at Florida when a lot of the coaching industry expects Napier to get canned like midway through next year? Yeah. Somebody will go take that check, and they'll they'll be like, hey, give me multiple years guaranteed if you guys say this thing isn't a sinking ship. We, we see this every year in the offseason. It's so like somebody will take the job. Who started for uh, them in the in the mail bowl? Was Harrell. it quarterback? Who? Connor Harrell. Harrell? Yeah, okay. When he, when I thought he, he played all. Hey, look, I thought he played all right. Yeah, I thought like the very first possession because it was like what third and fifteen, and then he took off with his legs and picked up the first down, and I was like, oh, that because like he just like that was a bolt of lightning. So there's there's something there. Like, I don't think he's going to be Drake May, but I, I just you, saw flashes from that kid. That kid's got some potential. You put him with the Marion Hampton. That is a dangerous backfield yeah. that could present some problems. You've still got some talented wide receivers that are there. Um, yeah. It, North Carolina is not going to be a top 25 team going into next year. And, and maybe we see the reverse then, right? Instead of coming in with all the hype in the world, then instead they kind of get to work their way up. They, they, they could finish with the same, with another eight win season and it would feel much different next year than it would before. Historically, this is a seven to eight win program. And like, but this is where I'll push back a, just one last thing. Cause we don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but it got so bad those last two seasons under Larry Fedora that Mac Brown was not an unserious hire because nobody was going to the games. There was absolutely no buzz, no pop, no booster investment. If you were still operating in that kind of place, then you were going to fall like woefully behind. And so that you you had to make a hire like that or else you were, you were going to fall to places that North Carolina football really doesn't spend a lot of time at. But but you're just cooking people in the live chat. Not even- <laughs> he said, "I just meant to mute you to this man." <laughs> yeah, I, I accidentally blocked him. I just meant to mute him. Like I don't, I don't care about his opinion. I, I just, I, I must hit the wrong button. I'm sorry. I, I don't want to prevent him from seeing my takes. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> coming up on the other side. Uh, hey, hey, bud. Coming up on the other side. Let's talk about. Uh, let's talk about the Orange Bowl. And more of the games from December 29th to January 1st. Next. The Scudetto, where the soul of Italy meets the pinnacle of Calcio. Catch Seria on CBS Sports Network and streaming live on Paramount+. Plus. Guys, we at the Cover 3 Podcast are a finalist for the best American football podcast category in the sports podcast awards. And this is something that requires votes for us to be able to bring home the trophy. Have we been a finalist before chip? This sounds familiar. You're damn right. We have been, and this time we're coming for that top spot. So help us bring home some hardware and use the link it or in the QR code, the YouTube chat, all, all the different places. We are going to give you the link. It is sportspodcastgroup.com slash sports underscore category slash best American football podcast. Again, we will put it in the description if you are listening to this wherever you get your audio podcast. We have it right now in the chat. It will be in the YouTube description. And if you're watching this live or whenever on youtube.com slash cover three, we've got a QR code on the screen. You scan that QR code and the process, honestly, will only take you about 30 seconds to get there, uh, log in, vote, 
and then that will help us be able to win. Again, we are a finalist for Best American Football Podcast from the Sports Podcast Awards. Your support has helped us get to this point, but now we need your action to be able to get us all the way to the finish line as the winners. Thank you for your continued support of the Cover 3 Podcast. You know, I'm just going to say it. We're the best football podcast, American, South American, European, African, Asian. We're just, we're better than, we know more about that sport than they do too. Let's be real. Just a bunch of talking heads blowing out their ass. We, we're the real ball knowers over here. Yeah. Ne- next year, best worldwide football podcast. You guys want to talk about like some, some four, four, I mean, two, two, some four, two, three, one. What do you guys want to go on? <laughs> Well, listen, I just know that right now, among the big five European leagues, the way that Fiorentina is able to stifle the buildup mm-hmm. for opponents right now is right mm-hmm. up there with Barcelona. You know, like it's right up there with some of the top sides in the entire world. And it's almost like uh, Vincenzo Italiano, a.k.a. Vinny Italy. It's like he mm-hmm. knows what he's doing out there. Can yeah. goal scoring become a little bit of a problem? Yes. But if you stifle the buildup and you got enough strikers that can put it in the back of the net, hey, that's that's how you get to Europe. That's how you get to Europe, baby. Yeah. I mean, I, Napoli could sure use themselves a Vinny Italy chip. Just might want to watch that. Oh, listen, I'm used to sending off the best uh, <laughs> best pl- talent to other sides. So might as well have uh, managers as well. Okay. Let's, uh, we don't need to hit every single game. I'd rather go like topic or take or, or you know, thought uh, along the way. And Tom, you had mentioned as we were getting set for the show, and it, it does work uh, chronologically. So we saw, Ohio State fall to Missouri in the Cotton Bowl. Mm -hmm. It's a huge win for Coach Drink and the Missouri Tigers in terms of just just overall, like um, that's going to help with investment. That's going to help with buzz. You're on the recruiting trail. Obviously, it's already paid off in a new contract as well. But also a lot of frustration for Ryan Day. You know, the most vocal Ohio State fans, they came right back out you know, with some of the the same criticisms of their head coach. What are you thinking about the Buckeyes in the wake of that defeat? Uh, I'm, I'm not optimistic about them, clearly. Like, going back to what I was talking about with Walker Howard, what I saw from the QB situation in that game, that that's not promising. Devin Brown, I, I know they're high on him, but I'm yet to see Devin Brown finish a game healthy. Anytime he's had a key role, he gets banged up a lot. He's injury prone. That is a problem. Keen Holst was thrown into a tough situation. Third string freshman, no real experience being put in there against the Mizzou team. That's pretty good. And it looked like exactly what you would expect it to. I would say the positive to me is that the defense held the Missouri team that was one of the best offenses in the SEC in the country all year long to 14 points. Like Mizzou did not get anything going until the fourth quarter. So that's a good sign for Ohio State. But offensively, man, I just, it's, I watch teams in bowl season have to go to backups because of opt outs and they figure out ways to put, you know, put points on the board and move the ball. Ohio state had however many weeks to get ready for this game with Devin Brown. He gets hurt. Clearly that throws a wrench in the pro- the process, but they weren't good before he got hurt. And it's just, it's, I, I don't know. It's just, there's a vibe about Ohio state right now that to me is just off. I, I, it's going to be a very, very important offseason in Columbus. I I think I I catch the same vibe that you're you're suggesting there, but I'm also it's still Ohio State, and I'm not going to go nuts about a bowl game. Like mm-hmm. Ohio State care about the game. On the one hand, their player like a lot of their players actually played, but not all. Yeah, that I, I think they were mostly full for the game. I, I think they win the game and probably comfortably if Brown doesn't get hurt. Like I know they didn't do a lot with him in there, but there was a noticeable drop off, you know, between he, he and and, and Kinehols. Like Kinehols, the offense, they literally went to the Wildcat like quite a bit when he came in there. So you know, to me that that is a problem when you have to run, you know, your your third string true freshman quarterback out there. They were they were pretty much inept. Um, the other problem I had, they didn't play their starting center. And I'm really not sure why, but they had to move the other guy, or one of their guards over to center. And they were, like the right guard they played, he was just getting destroyed. I don't know who that is. I, I, I didn't go back and look. There's a lot of things going on around New Year's with, 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 the, with the recruiting stuff. But just watching that live, I was like, oh, my God, like this kid is just getting his lunch ate. So uh, they had a couple guys miss the game. 
I still think it's Ohio State. They're still going to be the favorite to win the Big Ten next year, right? Pretty. Yeah. JJ's is going pro. Like, dude, fifth. There's going to be 15 NFL draft picks from Michigan's team. You think Oregon? I think Michigan's going to be the favorite to win the Big Ten next year. The betting favorite or the media? I can see the media doing it, but I don't think I don't think the betting markets will agree with that. Um, I. If Will Howard's Ohio State's quarterback, I hope Ohio State's the favorite to win the Big Ten. Who's Michigan's quarterback? I'm betting J.J. McCarthy. Oh, I think McCarthy's going to go pro. Mm. If McCarthy's back, th- then I rescind the take. I, my, my take is based on the, the assumption that, that McCarthy's going to go pro. But totally could be right. And, um, <clears throat> and also, I might rather have Alex Orgy than Will Howard. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about that. that. That might be a little, a little much. Um, but yeah, like I, I, I want to see. I don't know. I, yeah, does Ohio State like feel like they're on the verge of taking a step, or does it feel like they basically just had a missed opportunity for two years? I mean, the the missed margins that Ohio State operates with give them one of the highest floors in all of college football. And so when you say they're still Ohio State, then yes, they can roll the balls out and win 10 games. But that is not the expectation at Ohio State. And the question is, and if, if you are, I'm just going to, I'm going to put on the, uh, what's, what's his name? Big Nut. I'm going to put on the Big Nut face paint right now. <laughs> shave my head. Isn't that that's, a, that's actually a pretty good nickname. Like, <laughs> I mean, that, you could do worse. All mm-hmm. right. So if I was taking on that character, the frustration is, do I believe that Ryan Day and this coaching staff are good enough to be able to tackle the small margins that are required to go from 10 to 12 wins? And the performance in this bowl game, be it from a preparation, execution standpoint, do not give me more confidence than I had going into it. All across the country, everyone was dealing with opt-outs. Everyone was dealing with having to get creative and find ways to win. And Ohio State, offensively, which is supposed to be Ryan Day's calling card, was lifeless in this game. Yeah, but, I mean, do we think that, like, you really guys, you guys don't really think Missouri beats them with Brown, right? I think Missouri could have beaten them with Brown, yes. The offense yeah. wasn't doing anything with Brown. I thought Ohio State was going to win the game with Kineholz in. That's how bad they were making Missouri's offense look. Like, they were abusing those guys. It, yeah, but once Missouri got the ground game going, it was a wrap. Once Cody Schrader got off the mat and started picking up little yard, like he didn't have any huge runs, but like which early in the game, he because, couldn't move the ball at all. Yeah, and which happened in part because Ohio State wasn't doing anything to help its defense out. Yeah, it felt mm-hmm. like the defense had to start taking wild chances at the. I, I don't know. I, I I like I don't really downgrade Ohio State and Penn State for what happened in the bowl games because of who they had out. I think if Ohio State wins the Big Ten next year, it'll be because of its defense. And his defense is nasty. And so, mm-hmm. yeah. And I also uh, think something about the offense, too. Yeah. But I also think they need to fix, like, they need to fix their special teams. Like, I, Ohio State fans have been complaining about it all year and, and for good reason. Like, the special teams has been a problem for them all season long. They need to get that back in check because when you're trying to win, like, especially now with Washington, Oregon, USC, UCLA, you cannot win the Big Ten next year with like one third of your team being that poor. Mm hmm. Man, special teams was an adventure in every single bowl game. Mm-hmm. I mean, especially in the semifinals. Um, all right, bud. What out of this crop of games? Um, what what are some of the point? Point me to one. Point me to a team. Point me to a game. Point me to a, a result. What was something that stood out to you? Um, Oregon scored about as many points as I thought they would score. Like I thought Liberty would score some points. They actually. Oregon's defense played better than I anticipated it would after the opening series. Um, but I, I didn't think Liberty's defense had the dudes to run. W- I just, I wasn't sure how well Oregon's defense would play like that. To me, that was the question. Mm-hmm. It's like, all right, if Oregon gets some stops, it's going to score 40 plus. Uh, if it doesn't get stops, Liberty can hold the ball. So like, cause they play so slowly cause it really is a spread option team that that game, it, it was a hard game for me to handicap in that way. Right, because I was like, eh, if if Oregon doesn't take this seriously, and they did have some opt outs on defense, I was like, eh, I don't know. Um, 
I went 47 13 in my prediction on FSU Georgia. So I missed that by <laughs> like three, three or four touchdowns. Um, <laughs> but when the team is encouraging guys to get their surgeries, yeah. you know, be like, hey, like, no, they, they just told us these games don't matter. This Orange Bowl doesn't matter. Get your surgeries, get right for pro day. I, I think that gives you a pretty good indication of, you know, what, uh, of, of how seriously FSU took the Orange Bowl. I think they actually would have opted out of the Orange Bowl had they not had multiple prominent they alumni. Did. They opted on, out well, of right, the Orange Bowl. Well, right, but I mean, <laughs> they showed up, they took the check. They're like, we're, we're just here so we don't get fined. Had they not had, like, had it been, a, had it been the Cotton Bowl, I think FSU opts out. Seriously. But do you think because that's the lame? Orange that would have been like, so lame. That yeah, would have been lame. so lame. I, I, they, had, they didn't have any interest in playing the game, but they have multiple prominent alumni on the Orange Bowl committee and who are really tied to the Orange Bowl that they were stuck. Like, if it's a Fiesta Bowl or Cotton, I think FSU actually opts out of it. I do uh, find it disappointing, though. Like, I can't say what I would do in that same situation. I've never been in that situation. But I'd like to think that if what happened to Florida State happened to me, I would have taken it in the, well, F these guys. I'm going to go beat the shit out of Georgia and I'm going to show them how stupid and how wrong they were. Now I probably would have lost either way. Cause that's the, like, that's the part of this, like Georgia beat them by 60, mm -hmm. which yeah, damn. But like, I still think even if, if they don't have Jordan Travis, but they have the rest of the team, I still think Georgia's winning that game, just not by 60 points. So, but it's just, it's, I, I, it's like Chip, you said if they opted out, it would be lame. I think what they did was lame. I, I, I would show up and try to compete. And I think that that's part of, I think that's a side effect of the way that the roster was constructed for this year, because there was so much transfer portal, like bringing guys in that there really wasn't like once, once the goal was gone, there was no kind of more loyalty or connection to what the team and the program is. And that, to I me think, I think that's very sucks. fair. Sucks. Yeah, they, they built more of a team than they built a program. Mm -hmm. um, they also had a lot of guys come back who were seniors. You know what I'm saying? Who, like they, they came back for a reason, which was to win the conference and to make the playoffs. And then, you know, like Norvell said, they got told the games didn't matter. So why does this one matter? You know, and they just, like Farmer has surgery, Bethune has surgery. Like, a lot of these guys were like been playing through some stuff. They would play through it if it's the playoff. They're like, no, screw it. Like, I'm, I'm going to go get cut and make sure my body's right by the time we get pro day. Also, I want to talk to, like, the comments Kirby made after the game that got a whole lot of attention. But like Kirby saying, we have to do something about these opt-outs. Not saying that you don't want to try, but to use Florida State as an example of what's wrong with opt-outs, to me, is like, that's, that's the Black Swan event. That is not the norm. If you looked at all the other New Year's Six games, like we just talked about, Mizzou was pretty, pretty much full strength. Ohio State was as full strength as it could be, except for Marvin Harrison and Cal McCord, who left for Syracuse. Penn like, State had most, two out. Penn State and Ole Miss were – yeah, Penn State was Penn missing State had four, on defense. Right? They didn't both, have the shot. They didn't the have tackle. chop their corners yet. Penn State, I think, of the other teams, not Florida State, had the most opt-outs of key important players. But for the most part, these guys are showing up ready to play. So to use what happened at Florida State as an example of this is what's wrong with the bowl system today, chill. It's it's an outlier event. Can I rant on this, too, for just a second? Yes. Yeah. The, the expectation that we take bowl seriously has only existed for a very small period of time throughout the history of college football. Like we've played college ball with bowls for about 125 years. Only between 1974 and 1997 do they award the national championship after the bowls, mm -hmm. right? Bowls for the longest time, for most of recorded history in college football, were exhibitions. Once the BCS came around in 98, they went back to being exhibitions in terms of do they matter for the national championship race? No. So we need to take this bowl seriously. Guys, bowl games are not going to pay up big NIL to get these guys to play because they can't play or they, they can't pay enough money for it to matter. ESPN doesn't care. Bowl games largely exist for the most part to give you something to watch over the holidays when you're home so you don't have to talk to your in-laws when you're at their house, right? People are... Like nobody, like at no point do casual casuals watch more college football than during bowl season. Okay, so it's we're not going to fix this. There is no fix. Bowl do games are exhibitions. Also, bowl games didn't like, count for I don't records, read the stats until recently. So in two thousand, all of us had internet, right? No. Well, yeah, I was in. Yeah, I had the internet by then. Okay. Do you know how many bowl games there were in two thousand in the internet oh, era? Twenty-eight. 
25. That's a pretty good guess. All right. It's a really good guess. But it's 42 right now. Mm -hmm. Like, that, that, the idea of getting to a bowl and playing in a bowl game was more exclusive when only 50 teams did it. And yeah. now that's, you know, like this, th that's not tied to Florida State specifically, but it's just a, it's a different, different kind of environment. So it, it's a vacation, honestly, like, like, like we, we take it real seriously. It, it does suck for the fans because the schools put pressure on the season ticket holders. Like, Hey, but got to buy these tickets and stuff. I'm like, uh, I don't know. Like coaching staff didn't really care. They're like, how, how many, you know, how, how many fit aids and Celsius are they having a pound just so they can show up to their morning press conference? Cause like we saw you guys out last night and it was, it was pretty late there at the cigar bar, you know, pounding the bourbons uh, in Orlando. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm not going to overreact to any bowl really like, cause they're, they're exhibitions. I don't react to preseason games. Yeah. Some other final thoughts. I mentioned it a minute ago, the, the opt outs on Penn state. I think Ole Miss wins that game either way. Mm. I don't know if they score 38 points, but I think that they win that game because to me, the biggest takeaway of that game was Penn state's offense. Once again, against an Ole Miss defense that was not great this year completely no shows like they just that was the problem all year that's what they need to address in the offseason that defense is fine i don't you know people are like just big 10 offenses that's been no that wasn't the case um nico yamaliava did not have great numbers but man that kid looks good like if you look at his numbers against iowa nothing really stands out he threw for like 150 he rushed for 27, although he had the three rushing touchdowns. But to me, what stood out about him was he didn't make the mistakes like that you see all these quarterbacks make against Iowa. So for a kid in his first start to go against that defense and play a very clean game, Tennessee is going to be really good next year. I'm very much buying in on that. And to kind of go back to what you were talking about a second ago, bud, Hugh Freeze during Auburn's loss to Maryland. Again, a Maryland team that did not have Dalia Tagovailoa and completely dog walked auburn in the uh, music city bowl hugh freeze is apologizing during his th post third quarter interview on espn he's like yeah i'm sorry blah, blah, we just didn't come but then after the game he was talking about like he's the game plan he had nothing to do with the game plan so for an idea of how the seriously some of these teams take these games hugh spent the last few weeks recruiting he left preparing for the bowl game to his assistants that's just kind of an echo of the situation that a lot of these programs take when it comes to the bowl games it's almost like he treated it like an exhibition. Yeah. But <laughs> well, all right. Of Liberty's regular season last year. It's it's yeah, gonna get wild. Cool. I was I uh I talked with both Steve Sarkeesian and Kalen DeBoer about this. So um December 20th is the date of a first round college football playoff game next year. It was also the date this year of the early signing period. What in the world is a staff gonna do? when you're trying to prepare for a playoff game while also trying to lock down your signing class. And if the portal still has the same windows too, you're also trying to manage that, talk to your guys about whether they should be getting in the portal or not and, and weighing all those options. It's uh, Hugh made a decision. Am I going to spend my time recruiting? Am I going to spend my time getting ready for the Music City Bowl? It's a smart decision. Hugh Freeze has to win in 2025. I know people like who are pretty connected to big boosters at Auburn. They know Auburn's not going to be great next year. Okay. You got people in that division who probably will be. Well, no divisions anymore. But like like you know, traditional rivals mm -hmm. who probably will be. The pressure is on for Hugh Freeze to win in 2025. Every decision he makes has to be geared towards winning in 25. You have to recognize your window. Saban might be gone by then. Yeah. We'll see. Coming up on the other side. We turn our attention to Monday night's national championship game in Houston with a big game breakdown. Next. Out there, there are two colossal beings, both forces of nature in their own regard. But in here, as soon as the shoot bursts open, the duality of man and beast begins to fade. This is the PBR on CBS Sports Network. Back here on the Cover 3 podcast, all Wednesdays during the season include us going inside the biggest matchups of the weekend. So you know we got to do it here for Michigan-Washington. It's a big game breakdown. All 
All right, we're going to go uh, sort of each side of the ball, coaching matchup and X Factors. Remember, our official picks for this game uh, will be coming a little bit later. We'll do some best bets also on Monday's show. The day of the game, uh, we should have player props by then. That was something that we introduced last year. I think that was a lot of fun. So on the day of the game, Monday, January 8th, we will be doing our player prop best bets. We'll drop some of our best bets for the game, our official picks on Thursday, which, of course, is normally a locks uh, episode during the season. We're going to begin with Washington's offense against Michigan's defense, and we begin with the news breaking in the last you know, 12 to 15 hours that running back Dylan Johnson, who dealt with a foot injury early in the year and who after the game, uh, Washington said, Washington coach Kalen DeBoer said that, you know, it appeared to be a re-aggravation of that foot injury. Well, offensive coordinator Ryan Grubb has since said x-rays were negative. They're expecting Dylan Johnson to play in the game. Incredibly significant, especially how important Johnson has been in some of the biggest games of the season. Um, we can address that. We don't need to address that like in a big picture unless you would like to start there. Tom, you've got your Huskies hoodie on. Washington's offense against Michigan's defense. What are the tilting points in this matchup? The guards. Um, Washington's offensive line won the Joe Moore Award. It's a good offensive line. I don't know if it's the best in the country. I, I mentioned this on Twitter yesterday because we, we talked about it on the show with Michael Penix. I don't think this offensive line wins the Joe Moore Award with most other quarterbacks. I think mm -hmm. Michael Penix's ability to avoid sacks helped them out a lot as far as like people just looking at the stats and like sacks allowed and all that kind of stuff. But I think when I look at this Washington offensive line, at the tackle spots, they're good. At the center, they're good. I think both their guards are fine, but I think they are helped out by the guys they're surrounded by. And when I look at this Michigan defensive line and I look what it did against Alabama and they crushed the right side or the left side of Alabama's offensive line in the Rose Bowl. But the interior is where Michigan is. And we saw it against Texas. Byron Murphy and Devontae Sweat played well. They did not, you know, they, they were winning most of those battles. They weren't getting to Penix, but they were winning the battles. And they were bringing pressure. Michigan is going to do the same thing. The difference is Michigan has guys at the end who are better than I think what Texas had. It's a more complete defensive line. It is, has more depth on the defensive line. And it is going to be imperative for Washington to, in the middle of that line, to hold up against that, especially with Dylan Johnson, because based on what I saw, I don't know if he's going to be 100%. Like he might be willing yeah, do to play. Do you buy that? Because I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah. Like that. I was, don't buy what, what that was not a nice look. That was a high ankle sprain looking ass injury to me. So, I, I, I don't know that they're going to be able to run the ball that effectively. And as good as Penix is, and as great as those receivers are, if Michigan doesn't have to worry about your run game, it becomes a lot simpler to at least slow down the passing attack. And I do think that this Michigan defense, like, no, they have not seen a set of receivers like this this year. But the defense, like, for years, Michigan couldn't beat Ohio State. This team was built with the idea of we have to stop C.J. Stroud, Marvin Harrison, Chris Olave, Jackson Smith and Jigba, all these dudes. And then they did it. It's the same defense. It's the same principle. So it's not like this isn't something that Michigan has dealt with in the past. So I think that the key for Washington's offense will be to find a way to win on the interior and be able to at least give a semblance of a run game. And maybe we see like we saw in the Sugar Bowl, they use Penix more as a rusher just to keep the Michigan defense honest. Because, again, if you allow them to play one-dimensional on defense, they're going to win. I think a big part of this is – daring the Washington receivers to make the same contested catches again. And so like, I just don't believe that you're going to be able to do that again against our secondary. No, I, I think that they can definitely make contested catches. Can they make them at the same rate that they made them against Texas? That seems like something that if, if I'm Michigan's D coordinator, I would like to see again. We sure we're going to do that. We sure the ball placement's going to be that perfect again. Are we sure the sack avoidance is going to be like teleportation good again? I mean, the, the elusiveness in the pocket and Penick's ability to get his eyes back up and immediately find the right guy again, it, it speaks to him having such a great knowledge and maturity 
of understanding what that offense is and who's going to come open and win and why. But still, the, the avoidance in the pocket of some of those guys who came free, that was special. But I want to see if it's repeatable. Because if I'm Michigan and it is repeatable and he repeats it, I'm cooked. Right? I mean, it. Texas got some pressure up the gut, for Tom's point. And Washington's run game was not humming. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Washington does such a great job of scheming and formationing you, and obviously Penix knows where to go with the ball, of constantly having somebody open. Very few negatives. They're constantly moving forward. They don't get in a lot of like third and long type situations. You know, is Texas willing to challenge that? Or excuse me, is Michigan willing to challenge Washington in a way that Texas was not? And for good reason they were not, right? The Texas defensive backs are not great. We talked about this. Like, is Texas probably a, a better team than Washington? I think on power numbers, yes. On matchup, no, right? You know, can Michigan be a little more aggressive, a little tighter with its coverage and be willing to live with the consequences? And the answer to that is probably about the other side of this of this matchup. How many points do you think you can score if you're Michigan? How much do you believe in this Washington defense, right? I, I don't know. But if you go with the aggressive route, if you really challenge these receivers, can you get away with it? Because there's a downside to that if you do, and Penix cooks you for 45. Yeah, or, I mean, there were a couple of pass interferences, too, in that game mm -hmm. where just, like, players got beat, and all of a sudden, yeah, you know, you extend it by 15, you extend a drive right there. Uh, to your earlier point, my assumption is that there are two levels to the Dylan Johnson thing. You could call it gamesmanship, sure, um, but I, and I, I'm not just trying to be soft coming out of being really close to that team. But they love that dude. And I know he just showed up, but they they really love I think that they are gonna let him wear the pads, go out for warm-ups, and like, yeah, maybe give the impression of it. But let's let's be honest. When Jesse Mentor, the defensive coordinator for Michigan, is sitting down and sweating, yeah, he wants to make sure that they stop the run. But what he's really sweating about is about how to stop one, two, and eleven. Like and how, how to contain nine. Like that, those are the things that Michigan's defense will be based around. And I do think that if they are able to run the football effectively, like Dylan Johnson has been a huge part of it, but running the football effectively probably has to do with the five guys up front being able to block and being able to get a push to the point where uh, you're able to call it up, draw it up, and get the running plays you need. And if you're Michigan, you, you need to see some of this, right? Like you need Penix to pat the ball and hold the ball some, yeah. right? And that that has not been something that Texas made him do it's not something that Oregon made him do very well. And really, when he was healthy, almost nobody's been able to make him do so. But that I think that is part of the of the way that you start to get hits on him. I mean, he was not touched a whole how many how many actual hits did Texas have on him? Not a ton. Well, there's zero sacks. Um, right. Exactly. Yeah. I, I in quarterback hurries, I think are less than three or four. I mean, it was, and in a couple of them, like he had two times that he threw the ball away. I'm sorry, I'm going off the top of my head. Don't have it. But I know then there were also two or three times that he had somebody in his face and he just delivered a, not a strike, but like finds the guy underneath in the middle of the field just to be able to like keep things moving forward to your point with like a no negative plays type situation. P PFF ha has uh, Texas as recording zero quarterback hits. I don't know if that's accurate, but that, that, uh, like yeah, Penix so has their his definition own transfer is, portal. He just moves from one end of the pocket to the other. <laughs> yeah, the, their definition is hits allowed. So a pass rusher knocks a quarterback down as or after he releases a pass. If Michigan records zero quarterback hits, Michigan is not going to win the game. Yeah. I don't even need a bunch of sacks, but I, I do need him to be hit if I'm Michigan. But Jenkins, Grant, Graham, Stone. Stewart just coming in the game on a third down situation to come in there and and like make you move with his ability to come off the edge. This is let's see, let's play that game again. It's the best defensive front in football. Yeah, right. Yes. Okay. And it's not close. Like I mean, I know Texas has Sweat and Murphy, but the rest of it does not compare to what Michigan has at every spot. Yeah, yeah it was Sweat, so funny. Sweat might be the best of all those, but Michigan is deeper and and and. Mm -hmm. they're, yeah. I was talking to a scout on Monday night. He was saying that he thinks Murphy's going to run a 4 8 at the combine. That they had Murphy. Byron? Yeah. That yeah, they he might. Yeah. <laughs> he was working a camp for Herman 
when Murphy was in high school and the, the, he was like talking about the, I didn't know about all this, the, the wrist measurements, like all the projection software that they have where they like, they measure like neck, wrist, like all mm -hmm. these other things. And then they figure out what you're going to be down the line. And that Murphy was, Sweat was the, the deep defensive player of the year. I was talking about like, I love this guy. I think he's incredible. They're like in terms of NFL, like Murphy might end up being just right there, if not picked even higher in terms mm -hmm. of the, the defensive line in the NFL. But we don't need to talk about those losers. Anymore. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so best best defense. And I do love that in – if I could put my bud pants on real quick, um, we did say on this podcast, Michigan has the defensive line that everyone thinks Georgia has. Remember mm -hmm. where yeah. it's like, that's like, that's, that's the best group. And so that will be uh, an incredible challenge for uh, an offensive line that I did get the, the did get the upper hand on Texas, but even within that uh, made a couple mistakes along the way. So they, they got to be able to clean that up. Uh, going up against a, a challenge that's going to be even more, <clears throat> even more daunting. All right, let's flip to the other side. Michigan's offense against Washington's defense. I think that Washington's defense, statistically as a whole, looked like. And I think I might have said this on Monday night. If you were to put all of the playoff teams' offense, defense together, it looks like Washington's defense would be like among the lower ranked uh, units in this game. I thought they did a. I thought they did a very good job of um, defending Texas. I think Texas also didn't run the ball as much as they were successful at running the ball. I thought that Texas had a lot of success running the football. And here comes Michigan and Blake Corum and a team that seems to be on a mission to run that daggum football. So how is this Washington defense? What's going to be the key? Uh, stacking up against this Michigan attack. Can you make Michigan get into passing situations on third down? Like it's, I mentioned this on whatever day of the week it was that the playoff game was, because I genuinely have no idea what day of the week it is anymore. But like Blake Corum is not as good this year. And I got a lot of heat from it from Michigan fans. I, I know he ran for 25 touchdowns, but he's also averaging 4.7 yards per carry after averaging over six the last two years. He's not the same player. The knee injury has had an impact on him. And I thought it was a problem. The reason why Michigan was in so many third and longs was because Corm wasn't having a ton of success on the ground until that overtime. And also Donovan Edwards was pretty much completely wiped out by the Alabama defense too. He wasn't having any success on the ground. They need both of those guys to show up in this game. Donovan Edwards is very important to them. Donovan Edwards right now is the home run threat on that in that rushing game. Blake Corum is not. And I think they need him to play better because you can run the ball against this Washington defense. Like, Braylon Trice is phenomenal. Braylon Trice is a much better pass rusher than he is a run defender. And I think that you have to take advantage of that. And I think that if you can't, if you get into third and long situations – we saw what Braylon Trice did to Texas. And you look at this Michigan offensive line, I think in that game they deserve a ton of credit for how well they played. Trent Jones came in, a senior for Zach Center, and performed very admirably against that Alabama defensive front. But they still have problems at tackle. And Braylon Trice moves around. You're never exactly sure where he's going to come from, but I'm guessing he's going to be on the right tackle more often than not, especially in third and long situations. They've got to they've got to stay out of third and long because if JJ McCarthy in that game, like the limitations were evident when you put him in that spot. He is when you get him outside the hash marks with throws, he's not as accurate as he is between the numbers. And Alabama clearly focused on that because one of the most interesting things I saw Alabama do in that game. First snap of the game, you know who Terry and Arnold was covering? Colston Loveland. He wasn't even covering one of their receivers. He was covering the tight end. And it is going to be interesting to see what Washington does with that because clearly Alabama felt that their tight ends were the more dangerous weapons than the wide receivers. And for the most part, it was an accurate assessment because they completely shut the tight ends down. They did make some plays. So I look at Powell, who plays the slot corner for Washington more often than not. Muhammad is healthy. He is their best corner. He apparently came in at the end of the Sugar Bowl. I missed it, but I'm assuming if he came, yeah, he came back, the game, he'll be playing in this game. 
Where they put him is interesting, although he typically plays on the ex ex exterior, so I don't think they're going to bring him to the interior. Powell has mostly been their slot guy. I'm guessing he's going to be on Loveland. He's going to be on Barner. How good of a job he does in coverage will be very important to the Washington defense because it'll force McCarthy to make the throws he's not as comfortable making. And then, yeah, and I'm getting lost here, but can McCarthy make throws from the pocket? Because clearly they weren't comfortable leaving him in there against Alabama. Game script will matter quite a bit, obviously. Uh, if, if Washington comes out real hot as I – mean, and, and DeBoer is an excellent like excellent opening series type guy. He, mm -hmm. He's – I think he's actually profitable in the blind um, on, on some of this first quarter stuff. But ch check me on that before you follow that. That's not actionable. So game script will matter a lot, obviously. And that that's, seems like a no, no dub. But I think you can run the ball some on, on Washington. But it's really an I think because they did not face a lot of kind of hit you in the mouth type run games. Mm. Uh, the team that I would say is most comparable is probably that Oregon State team. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had uh, it's what, Fagua and who's the guard? Bloomfield? Fuaga and, and were, Bloomfield, yeah. They were both hurt, but they both played, if I recall. And Martinez didn't have amazing numbers, but they did you know, pretty consistently move the chains until Washington bowed up in the red zone. Now, in fairness, if I recall in that game, they did not have what Asa Turner, one of the safeties, and Washington was missing somebody else too. And in the game, it was kind of just crazy uh, Pacific Northwest conditions. Oh, it was raining. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. But in terms of like teams that'll get in heavier formations and run the football at you, they, they didn't see a lot of that this year. So there is a bit of an open ended question as to how Washington will play that. That's not me saying they can't do it. We just, we don't know. How many times did Washington face like two tight end looks or, you know, m more kind of 21 type personnel? We we don't really know. Uh, Oregon State does it some. Utah, when they had healthy tight ends, could do it. But I don't that I doubt they saw much of it in that game. Oregon does not do it a whole lot. Who else under schedule? Arizona State? No, because their tight ends were hurt a lot this year. Mm -hmm. Trying to they don't think. face power run games, really. Boise didn't. Michigan State doesn't even really count because they were game scripted out of that game so fast it really didn't matter. It's like 28 uh, to nothing five minutes into the game. <laughs> right. Not running a whole lot of two tight ends when, when you're down yeah. 28. So my point here is that there is a bit of an unknown as to Washington's defense when it has to face a, a bit higher, a, a, like a, a beefier well, yeah, like think well, about uh, Zion to Puli Fatui. Like it, you've got somebody on the outside who is an edge rusher. He's like 250, 260 pounds. And when he's not having to take on a huge tight end who's trying to set the edge for you on the outside run play, then you know he gets to tee off a little bit. And that will not be the case against Michigan. Uh, Trice is 275. They do have like <clears throat> inside, like Ale's 320, 330, something like that. Yeah. They've got size. Mm -hmm. I, I, he's got I, some beef. I do not think they are an undersized group. But it is a uh, it's it's going to be a different challenge than a lot of what they face throughout the season for sure. I mean, Styles make fights, and Michigan has also not faced a like top level passing offense. They did face a top level receiving core against but not Ohio a passing State, offense. But McCord was just not a good player in, for for Ohio State in that game. So uh, there's a lot of unknown here. Um, you know what else is unknown? I have no idea what Michigan's going to do. Like, this is the sandbaggingest ass coaching staff in the country. <laughs> like, Marvin Harrison said after the Michigan, after the game when they played this year, he's like, Michigan threw coverages at us that we didn't see on tape. You looked at the beginning of the Rose Bowl, they were in formations on offense I hadn't seen them in all year. And now I haven't watched, I've gone back to watch the tape. I might be wrong, but watching the TV copy, I was like, what the hell is this? I haven't seen this. So I don't know if they've got anything special planned for this game that they've been saving because, like, they do that. Like they they played basic ass vanilla football for the first three and a half months of the season because they knew they could. And then they've saved a whole lot of stuff for these moments. And they came back. Like their goal was to win the Big Ten. They thought they would do it. Their goal was to get to the playoff and win the damn thing this time. So they I guarantee you they have been working on stuff for these games. 
cannot believe the greatest coach in college football history got out coached in the Rose Bowl. You know, I got into a discussion with this with Barrett on HQ yesterday. I don't know that he got out coached. I thought both coaching staffs did a tremendous job. Mm. I think Alabama was very confused at the beginning of the game because, again, like you saw, the secondary was like they were looking at each other like, what the hell are we supposed to do? I don't know who I'm supposed to cover because they were in formations they weren't ready for. But then at halftime, I thought Alabama made all the proper adjustments. Once they got into the locker room, that coaching staff fixed it. They cleaned things up, and they came out, and they were the better team in the third quarter. And then Michigan kind of adjusted again and actually went back to its early game script on offense on that final drive and in the overtime to get the touchdown drive. So I thought both coaching staffs did great in that game, and I know it's easy to say Nick got out coached, and I know Alabama fans are going to feel that way. I just think Michigan's players won the football game. I don't think it was a coaching battle. So speaking of coaches, as we pivot to the coaching matchup, and the adjustments were to be made by Alabama, mm -hmm. right? Like the, Michigan that was the team. dictated what yes. needed to happen. Michigan's adjustment was stop dropping punts. <laughs> yes, right. You know, and and JJ McCarthy, please hit open receivers when, when when we ski in them open. Like if no adjustments were made, Michigan runs away with it, mm -hmm. based on how the first half played yes. out in terms of like offense and defense. And also going back to like our preview, like Chip and you were talking about, we were talking about like the Saban, like he's never lost, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's uh, the coaching advantage over Harbaugh. I kind of pushed back on that. Like McCarthy, I don't know if you saw his interview with uh, Dennis Dodd on the field after the game. They were talking about the, the play to Blake Corum on fourth down. And McCarthy said something that I thought was really interesting in that he says, well, we ran that play against them in 2019. And then he goes, well, he says, Hassan Haskins and Shea Patterson. I thought it was interesting that, JJ said we, but he said we saw like we went back to the 2019 game because the thing about Alabama's defense is, I mean, Nick Saban invented the way pretty much everybody plays pass coverage for the most part these days. But they've also not really, while they've adopted and they've adapted, they haven't really changed the general principles of what they're trying to do. And JJ says, well, we knew that if we put in this formation, what these guys were going to do and the running back would come out completely free. It's like it was a got to have it play. You save it for these moments. And it's just that kind of game prep for, I don't think fans in general consider like that coaches put into these games. Like when you get to this level, there's so much this year, particularly the sign stealing and all this kind of stuff, blah, 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 knowing the plays. These teams know each other inside and out before they ever get on the field. And, and yes, and be, yeah, sorry. go ahead. No, like to be fair, I, I was shocked at how well Bama played some of the stuff based on based on how they played it, how well they played it. At some of those condensed looks, I'm like, okay, they're gonna have to they're gonna have to have to check the zone here, and they'll they'll, they'll play this over top, and didn't. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, the, the the one near McCarthy pick is Bama's DBs just bullied those Michigan receivers at the line of scrimmage. Like, holy mm -hmm. cow! Like that should probably be a touchdown. Instead, it's almost a pick. Um, so. But yeah, like the, the ability to get them in, in predictable coverage based on certain looks and run it at a certain time. Michigan had to be thrilled that Bama was still playing it the same way in the fourth quarter. They Like to your point, Tom, they went back to it and they're like, oh, we're getting the same look here. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is going to score. All right, as, as we pivot to the coaching matchup, I want to think about roster construction. I want to think about what's being represented here. Because if you just go, just go, on like the 24 seven team talent composite these we are going to have a champion that is going to be one of the least talented again you know recruiting talent big big air quotes here on youtube.com slash cover three one of the least talented on paper national champions of the 21st century we also have the potential bud elliott i mean bud you you know, as, as I've discussed often, we have a lot of friends, right? We have, we have a lot of huge fans of the podcast. I'm leaving the Superdome. And you know what is the one thing that everybody's talking about? Everyone's what? buzzing? They say, chip, 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 chip. I'm like, what, 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 what? Do you know the blue chip implications here? Hey, is anybody, chip, have you talked about, about the blue chip implications? <laughs> but I'm not kidding. Like, this is, this is a hot topic of conversation among many of our, you know, friends, colleagues, peers. Everyone wants to know, Chip, have you talked to Bud? What are the blue chip ratio implications? So I went back, you know, as we're as I'm working on the story, and I was like, looking, I was like, oh, Washington, Michigan, by the way, is 53% 
as uh, as Bud calculated it going into the season. Michigan wins. The blue chip ratio stands. Washington did not make the 50%, though, before I jump into this, Bud included a section in his write-up on 24-7 Sports that said, you know, the transfer portal era, the extra year of eligibility has led to a lot of things that are uncommon to most of what college football has been over the last 20 years or so. And in one sentence, he said, so will, and he listed some teams, be the team to break that. And one of those teams that he mentioned was the Washington Huskies. He also mentioned Florida State. But he mentioned the Washington Huskies. And so you you recognize that if there were three or four teams that did not meet the blue chip ratio but could potentially win a national championship, Washington was one of them. So as you're looking at it, how, how do you – um, how do you weigh these different roster construction, uh, transfer portal, you know, all, all the different factors going into what we have with these two teams right now and Washington's chances to break the blue chip ratio? First of all, I, I love that people are yelling at you about the blue chip ratio. This, this is, <laughs> yeah, this is fun. Um, so I, I always put in there like at some point this will end, like this is sports, we do have Cinderella type stuff. If it's going to happen, it's going to be like a really veteran team with a truly special quarterback because quarterback is, is always the position that changes things in our sport of football. Can Washington do it? I don't know. Like the Mariota, uh, Oregon team was a team that looked like they were going to do it. They stomped FSU in the Rose bowl. And then, you know what? Big, bad, physical, big 10 team came down the tracks and stomped them out in the cotton bowl. Right. We've had this come down a couple times. The first Clemson team, uh, almost busted it, right? With, with Deshaun and Nick Saban onside kick. Turns out, what did Deshaun go? Like top 20 picking yeah. the first, you know, first round quarterback is probably how it ends. We well, are I mean, in a really, sorry, we're, we're, it's, it's Cam Newton in 2010 with that Auburn team, which like made blue chip barely, barely but yeah. like mm-hmm. overall doesn't check out on paper. 2016 Clemson, which made blue chip barely. That's the second one that you're talking about. Like, I'm TCU talking about the national champions, the, the ones right. that actually did win. So Auburn, Clemson, Clemson on paper, if you're just going recruiting rankings, like some of the lowest ranked. Cam yeah. Newton, Deshaun Watson, Trevor Lawrence. So I, I always I, – I do want to point this out. Like I don't really – I don't rank them within the list. To me, there's a certain like minimum level of talent that you need to recruit over a four-year period so that the guys who are starting for you – like we could be confident they beat out other guys who also have a certain level of physical tools. But like, I, I don't see the winning percentage track for a team that's like 80 as opposed to 55, right? At Hello, a certain Texas point, A&M. right? Like there has to be a certain level, like, okay, we're getting enough clay in here that is moldable, like high level athleticism frame body type. And then it needs to also be player development and understanding the type of player that you need. And like, does the 70th guy on your roster, does he make sense for the scheme that you run? You know, some of these teams out there are kind of just talent collecting because they're like, Oh, this guy's rated four stars. And you know, sometimes he's, he's available for a reason. And you get to the adverse selection problem. It's like, Oh, maybe he's available for a reason. Right? So as long as you're at that level, I really do think the rest comes down you know, to develop and making sure you have decent balance across the roster, you know, so you don't have 14, four star and five star DBs, but the, 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 maybe you have positions that are just wide open. Washington's really interesting in this era. Obviously they do have some portal guys on the team who have helped. They also have nine sixth year COVID seniors, mm-hmm. which the portal is not going to go anywhere unless we get contracts in sports. And that, that's probably going to take a few years. The, super veteran nature of Washington might be sort of a high watermark here uh, within our sport because, you know, they have six year guys. Not oh, all six the six year guys, year guys too. Play, like I, that was, that was my column on Monday night. I said, we're never going to see a team like this again. The COVID it's year is going to, yeah, mm-hmm. the COVID year is going to cycle out and like, we're all of a sudden going to shift. Like this is the most experienced title contending team that we've ever seen. And we'll probably ever see again. I mean, I generally think of like 18 programs that truly aspire and try to recruit to win a title. 
And like Washington is very like, I think they're like 19th or 20th typically. Like they're kind of fringy in that way. And we have people in the chat talking about Ole Miss. I don't put Ole Miss in that group because they don't recruit high school at that level. But the fact that we have people believing, I think is good for the sport. I like the talent spreading out a whole lot. I don't know that Bama having a 90% blue chip ratio is good for the sport overall. Like we need villains, but it, you want your villains to, to have a fatal flaw, right? Now this year they did have one, but um, like you, you want them to feel beatable. And in some years they don't, but I think for our sport to have more fan bases believing is generally healthy. Now, the fact that we're getting that in the 14 playoff is actually kind of cool too, because we're going to have even more belief in the 12. Tom, what do you think about the talent between these two teams? I think Michigan's more talented. I think that both are very well coached. And I think that Washington being at a quote unquote talent deficit is wiped out by having the better quarterback and the better wide receivers. And I think that's been the case for Washington pretty much the entire season. So it's, I, I think that Michigan is going to win this game. I think Michigan can blow Washington out. I think Washington can win this game. I don't think Washington can blow Michigan out. Mm. So it's like when I look at the range of potential outcomes in my mind, based on what I've seen from both of these teams, and I will once again remind people that I said Washington was going to the playoff in September after it beat Michigan State, called them a wagon. What, can't you spell Washington without chip? Wagon. That's right. But I just think that the range of outcomes here, I think Michigan is the best team in the country. I think Michigan has been the best team in the country all season long. And I don't think that changes in this matchup. I think Michigan will be your national champion. But also tune in to Thursday's show to see if Tom picks him <laughs> against the spread, minus four and a half, whatever the number is at that time. Not saying where I'm going there, but I think Michigan will win. All right. Um, all right. We'll, we'll again, we're going to continue to just keep the discussion going on this matchup uh, through Thursday. Uh, on Monday, we'll be hitting our props, uh, breaking down some of the game props here. One last note, breaking news during the show. I just, it, instant thought here. Um, we've got a, according to reports, the Bruce Feldman, uh, LSU has fired defensive coordinator Matt House, as well as def the assistant, defensive assistant coaches, Kerry Cooks, Robert Steeples, and Jimmy Lindsay. Massive staff overhaul by Brian Kelly coming for year three. Again, I'm, I'm seeing that from uh, Bruce. It might be official as well. Might as well be official if Bruce is saying it. Um, I mean, LSU's defense was not good all season long. They also lost their offensive coordinator. And, uh, what's our temperature check of Brian Kelly's program? Well, he's taking the Michigan job, right? I'm Look... My temperature check of LSU's program is if I had you certified top tier, because again, I'm always looking at this right now with the 2024 mindset of trying to reorganize the SEC in two ways. I'm trying to reorganize it with no divisions, and I'm trying to reorganize it with um, – uh, Texas and Oklahoma added to the mix. I'm trying to reorganize a 16-team conference. I'm not doing this by schedules. I'm just talking about like big picture, pecking order type stuff. It is not an encouraging off season for LSU if you want to keep LSU in that top tier. And you might not have had them there to begin with. But I think you are fall. You are getting closer with all the turnover that's happening right now. You are probably getting a little bit closer to the big gluttonous middle than you are to the more toit spots at the top. Well, then here's a question I, for you. If you had to rank, sorry, yes, if you had to rank SEC teams in 2024 on their potential to make the college football playoff, how many teams are you putting ahead of LSU right now? Georgia, Alabama, Texas. I think Alabama. Yeah. I'm putting Alabama ahead of LSU. Ole Miss. I actually I mean, think that we shouldn't I, be that close. Do. We should, we should not LSU be. has the schedule though. LSU yeah. draws Vandy. LSU's road games are Arkansas, AM, 
Florida late in the season in which the chance Billy Napier's fired is high. non-zero. High. It's not non-zero. And, it is high. <laughs> and at and at South Carolina. Like LSU has a very manageable schedule. They could they could be what Ole Miss was this year. Right? Not that great of a team. Only like two decent tough games. You win the rest of them. We'll see. I now mean, their non con's interesting. They get USC and UCLA in the non con. Mm-hmm. I just, I, I think they're falling closer to the gluttonous middle than they are to those surefire spots at the top. I mean, isn't I, everybody else though? Like, I don't know. This looks like Georgia and everybody else, but uh, they, they won the game and it was a very fun game. But to me, watching LSU give up what thirty one points to Wisconsin. Yep, I saw that Wisconsin offense a lot this year. That was. Far and away, the best game Wisconsin's offense had, and they were missing Braylon Allen. They were missing DK, who transferred. They were missing a whole lot of guys. But, man, did they look incredible in that game. So, neighbors played the first half, apparently, and then, yeah, and then, then once he got out. his record set out? hmm That tracks. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right. We will be back Thursday, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, where, among other things, we will be giving you our official college football playoff picks against the spread, over-unders, and more. So come and hang out for that, and you can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernell. You can follow him at BudElliot3. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you.